Yeah, the Holocaust. Today is remembering Holocaust, Holocaust Remembrance Day here, January 27th. And for this discussion here in Think Tech, uh, we have Peter Hoffenberg, um, our co-host, and Seymour Kazimersky, who has had a long history with Think Tech, but a long history with the Holocaust also. They both have. So, uh, Peter, can you, can you try? I know it's going to be hard. Can you try to introduce Seymour? It's very difficult. I think many folks actually recognize Seymour. Uh, he wears lots of different hats. So we've asked him today to discuss on Holocaust Remembrance Day uh, his public commitment to teaching children and other people about the Holocaust and his uh, very deep family connection uh, to the Shoah, which he'll talk about, I assume, about his beloved mother of, of blessed memory. So Seymour, we're looking to you to update us, to think about what the status of Holocaust education is today and how um, seemingly, as Rousseau said, two contradictory things can occur. There seems to be a tremendous amount of education, a tremendous number of classes and exhibitions, and at the same time, uh, denial, revisionism, exploitation. I mean, both, both narratives are working together. So I return to Jay, who always asks the on-point questions, and then I will just chat when Jay and you would like me to. So welcome. Okay, so Thank you for taking Welcome, time. Seymour. Uh, I want to play a short uh, piece that Think Tech made as a commentary on, on uh, Remembrance Day. Okay, we'll play that now. That's uh, an opener for you. Wow. Yeah. So, Seymour, what is what is the condition of knowledge or ignorance in the country, maybe the world, about holo the Holocaust, and, and what are you doing about it? Well, let's first talk about the education portion of it, Jay. Uh, and, of course, the country is a very, very large country. Here in Hawaii, uh, I speak to about 140 schools. I've been doing it for 38 years now. Uh, I do it to about 4,000 to 5,000 students a year. Uh, we've been doing it by Zoom the last couple of years. Prior to that, we were doing it live. And I have to tell you, I have thousands of letters from students, from teachers, who say that the experience of understanding the lessons of the Holocaust that we teach the children are some of the most important things they learn during the school curriculum. Why? because they understand what happened to an individual. And of course, I'm talking about my family, as Peter said. They understand what happened to my mother and they understand how she saw her mother killed in, right in front of her, how she lost everybody, 64 members of her family, brothers, sisters, grandparents, everybody. And that itself makes a mark on the kids and the students. And even in, in college, when I go to UH or Chaminade, these kids remember, they remember what we're teaching them. They remember the lessons of the Holocaust and why we have to con continue to do what we do. And I think that part of the education portion here in Hawaii is important. And I have to tell you, just last night, uh, we opened an exhibit at UH West called America and the Holocaust. And this is the opposite of what we're talking about. It's the education of non-education. It's what happened during the war in America. Why did America not give Jews? Why didn't they allow them to come into the US? Why did they appease Hitler? And those are the questions for historians. Those are the questions for Peter. We need to understand 
exactly what happened during that time, because if we don't understand what happened, it's going to repeat itself. And it will repeat itself not just for Jewish people, it could be for many other genocides around the world. Ah, oh. Peter, he mentioned your name. No, I heard that. I'm not sure why. Seymour, what, what, would, you like, what would you like me to add? Um, I apologize. I have not been to the exhibit. I will go. I'm happy to come back and talk with Jay about it. Uh, Jay and I have talked about the Shoah and the US. Uh, it remains a controversial issue. So I would, I would really like to go and visit the exhibit before I make any comments about it. Um, I, uh, just as a historian, have probably a less critical view of the US than the organizers of that exhibit. So uh, rather than misleading anybody, let me, let me visit the exhibit and then I'm happy to, we, maybe we can have you back on. Um, I'm but sure after, both of you individual, both of you guys have been to the Holocaust Museum yes. in Washington. Peter, you want to say what your experience was in visiting it? Well, my experience had a couple different facets, which will not surprise people. Uh, let's be honest, uh, for a lot of folks uh, situated on the mall, uh, it is just one more museum. And that's always a risk. You know, in the morning you go to uh, natural history, and then in the afternoon you go to the Holocaust Memorial. So it has a, a kind of a difficult challenge, right? It's not on the space of a camp. So it's not like visiting Auschwitz. Um, it tries to suggest, and I think this is part of the difficulty, and you know, Seymour and I, we can talk about this as good friends. There's always a great tension in the Shoah between seeking some universal lesson and remembering that it is primarily a Jewish experience. And the two do not, uh, the two are not easily married. Uh, for your listeners who might uh, have knowledge about American history, look, it'd be like going to an American uh, museum about slavery, which there is not and there should be, and saying, well, slavery is universal. That, that does rob the experience of the African American component. And so part of my concern about the museum, you say, how did I react to it? Uh, it has an incredible archival collection. So the question is not denial as if it did not happen, right? That's really an extreme. And even today, that's an extreme. You're more likely to meet people who revise it for their own interests, or as at SOB on January 6th, I basically said the work was not done. The jerk with the Camp Auschwitz. Okay, to so go to this museum, you cannot deny it happened. All right, that's, that's for the most absurd position. But as Seymour says, what is the lesson? And my lesson as a historian uh, was to see a real tension. You, you see the Jewish experience, then you come out and you're asked to uh, prevent it from happening again or compare it to something else. Um, when that's your objective, that conditions how you study something. So my short answer to you is look at the exit surveys. And the exit surveys disproportionately from young people and their parents equate the Jewish experience with the experience of Jesus. You can even look at the most recent translation of Elie Wiesel's Night, and the editor equates the Shoah with the crucifixion. And I think we all ought to stop for a minute and think about <laughs> that very common association. So that's um, my answer. My answer is It both. wasn't that way for me. You know, I went there, I was blown over by it. And I yeah, told you guys before, before the show, I was telling you about this one alcove, which had a bunch of correspondence where the rabbinical council was asking the secretary of war during World War II uh, to blow up one of the concentration camps so that the uh, infrastructure, the ovens and all that would be destroyed and they would have to stop the assembly line. And finally, after a long delay, the Secretary of War wrote back to them. And he said, I'm, I'm afraid we, we can't do that because, quote, it would make Herr Hitler angry, end quote. And then you get a window into what was going on in the government and why they didn't allow the ships here and why they didn't allow the ships after the war either. So, I mean, my experience at the, at the museum was really profound. But then, you know, in anticipation of this show today, Seymour, I, I watched Schindler's List, and it was just as powerful the second time around, if not more powerful. 
Can I go back, Jane? Can I go back to the education? Because yeah. Peter and I are both involved in education. He is a historian and me as a as basically an educator for the Holocaust. Uh, uh, two, three weeks ago, I went to Punahou when I spoke to a senior class at Punahou. And one of the one of uh, what uh, one of what the teachers have to do is they have to prepare the students for me, which means I don't want to be coming in there and just telling them what the what the Holocaust is. And they have to prepare questions for me. The questions led to the most important fact of why personal education is so important on the Holocaust. Every single student there asked me pertinent questions about bullying, about racism, about bigotry, about, uh, 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 about anything to do with how to treat other people as the most important part of the lesson. And I think that's something that we forget. Yes, it, Peter is correct. You go to the Holocaust Museum or Yad Vashem or any place else, and Jewish people like us three all have a very common, oh my God, this is amazing. But don't forget, when I went to Punahou, I think there was one Jewish student there and the rest were not Jewish. And the letters I got from them afterwards thanking me for opening their eyes to what they have to do to change the way they live against bullying, against hatred, against all of those racism issues that we have. And I think that, to me, makes me keep doing this over and over again. Well, you should, and uh, absolutely, but it should be happening all over the country. Uh, I was telling you guys there was an article in Haaretz, which is the New York Times of Israel this morning, uh, expressing outrage at the action of a school board uh, in Tennessee that outlawed a book on the Holocaust from the curriculum in that, in that school district. It's extraordinary. And this is a classic book, too. It's been around a long time. But, you know, in terms of whether people understand what happened, uh, whether they have had education in general, uh, I suggest to you that Hawaii is special. And you can find people who are relatively tolerant here, for the most part. Um, and I, I would like to uh, put a, a list of the prison camps the concentration, the death camps on the screen so that we can see how many there were and uh, we can get a handle on whether people have heard these names. Uh, can, can you read them just here on Remembrance Day, Seymour, um, if Certainly. you can read the German? Okay, so they start, obviously we all know Dachau and we know Auschwitz and we know Treblinka, but has anybody heard of some of these other camps? Uh, uh, Ravensbrück, Dobedor, Kovno, Stutihof, Chemano, Belzac, Lublin, of course, we've heard of, Gross Rosen, Flossenburg, Natzweiler, Strufer, Hinzherr, Wittelsberg, Her Herzogenbach, uh, Nürkelbaya, Nür Mitzelaya, Buchenwald, of course, Mauthausen, Dachau, uh, Sachhausen. There's so many, and these were all camps that very few people knew or know about. And I think it's important to realize that all of Europe was taken over by Hitler. And when he built his camps in, in Germany and in Poland and some of the outlying areas, he really wanted to exterminate a race. This was not about just killing Jews. He was exterminating a race. And I, I'll, I'll never forget my mother who said at the end of her interview with General Stackpole, when she said, Hitler didn't win the war, I won the war. I'm here as proof to show that Hitler lost the war. And I think that's so important because people then realize that this was all about individuals. It was all about people who were willing and able, thank heaven, to withstand everything that they had gone through, including what you were talking about. And that is the United States, Britain, Canada, saying, oh, we don't want to get involved. We don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to uh, do something that Hitler might not like. Stupid things like that. But yet, we, were, we survived. So one thing, uh, Peter, is that uh, you look now, and it's uh, 70 years later, and you say, well, uh, do people remember, really? Do they know? Um, you know, many generations have passed. And maybe there's a lot of deniers around. 
um, and they don't know, they don't remember, they don't want to know, they don't remember. And, and um, you know, the, for a long time, at least in my, my childhood, never again really meant something. Uh, now, you know, it's more like, again, and, and some people have the, the chutzpah to say that six million were not enough. Um, it, it's really extraordinary how out of the ashes, there rises another new anti-Semitism now. And so I, I ask you, you know, what, what is happening, at least in Europe, um, with regard to remembering? You know, if you have to say Remembrance Day, you're kind of assuming that a lot of people are forgetting. Mm. Good point. Well, connecting Europe today with anti-Semitism, which seems to be what you're asking me about, we see some uh, similar seeds to the Shoah, right? Extreme nationalism in Europe, which has always in one way or another uh, attacked the Jew. It was known as the Jewish question in the 19th century. So for us European historians, uh, Hitler's attitude and policies are the extreme of a question that was asked uh, for a long time and certainly asked ever since uh, Jews were emancipated from the ghettos. So part of this is an assimilation issue. And look, you're seeing in places like Hungary and France, even in uh, Northern Europe, uh, attacks on Jews are are also linked to attacks on Muslims and Muslim immigrants. Uh, very rarely are Jews as only Jews targeted. In all these societies, Jews, I mean, it's a traditional group, right? Uh, the Romai, the gypsies are still attacked, Jews are attacked, uh, Muslims are attacked. So one answer is we're dealing with a period as the European Union fractures. And one of the issues of Mr. Putin uh, is whether or not you agree with Russian expansion uh, you know, whether or not uh, one ethnicity has the right to conquer another ethnicity. And if that's the case, that's another foundation of Nazism. Two is uh, Hitler and the Nazis took advantage of the technology they had at the time. You and I talk every week about social media. Well, uh, everywhere from FDR and Gandhi on one side, Hitler and Mussolini on the other side, they took advantage of radio and they took advantage of film. The way that anti-Semites and haters today, right, create uh, unions among people who will never meet each other, who might ironically, remember one of the uh, leaders of January 6th uh, was a person of color, ironically, probably on the web, the other jerks never recognized or knew this was a person of color. And so you have, secondly, uh, transnational cultural connections, which inflame this. Uh, thirdly, and I very much appreciate uh, the listing of the camps, and that's not, that's actually an incomplete list. Uh, there are more camps. Mm. Um, and traditionally now, uh, on a Holocaust Remembrance Day, or Yom HaShoah, which is the Jewish Holocaust Remembrance Day, this is the United Nations Day. There is Yom HaShoah, which is a Jewish day. And traditionally for the Kaddish, we add the names of all the camps. And most young people have fallen asleep by the time you get to the end. It's a long, <laughs> wow. it's a long list, but there are two points I'd like to make, and this is really Seymour's show, so let me just make them quick. One is that it is an intellectual and historiographical decision to focus on the camps. And by focusing on the camps, we forget that just as many, if not more, people were killed traditionally by knives and guns. And so in our lessons about the Holocaust, and we talk about bullying and violence, etc., cetera, uh, we don't do a full service to emphasize the industrial killing as many murders were non-industrial. Okay, that, that's one thing. Secondly, uh, it's important to list the camps. It's more important, I think, probably historically to notice where they were. And a disproportionate number were on Polish soil. And that remains today a major issue. In many cases, the Germans, German students would recognize all those names. Uh, Polish students, would recognize the names as places in which Poles were murdered or Soviets used the camps afterwards. So it's good to list, right? But it's important to know how these different societies respond to each of them. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, a couple of thoughts uh, on that is that there's another alcove in the Holocaust Museum, <clears throat> which describes what happened when the displaced um, people, Jewish people who had been a move to the soft underbelly of Europe, uh, tried to go back to Poland in the late later 40s, 46, 47, 48. Um, and uh, the Poles in their towns and villages 
itself. They were coming back to reclaim their land and their shops and, and their farms, and they killed them. Uh, so th there was a, an abiding anti-Semitism there. Uh, and maybe that's one of the reasons why the Germans could put the camps in Poland, because it was a fertile ground, so to speak. Um, anyway, I wanted to, uh, Seymour, I wanted to ask you about uh, Schindler's List, because of, of all the movies that have covered World War II, uh, it it's, seems to me to be accurate. Uh, it seems to me to be a, um, you know, um, a sort of a one story in a larger picture of what happened. Uh, how do you feel about that movie? How do you feel about the examination of Schindler and his industrial complex against the background of the Holocaust? Well, assuming we realize that these are movies and there are poetic licenses that are that are taken by the directors and and and, and the producers, I think that they prove an invaluable resource for my teaching and for any educator. If we have the students watch any of these movies like Schindler's List, The Pianist, et cetera, uh, uh, they really do grasp it a lot better than me just speaking about it. And that's why I believe video is so important. But I wanted to ask Peter a question, social media. I'm finding more and more anti-Semitism. There are so many sites now about anti-Semitism on social media. As a historian, aren't you worried that this could uh, bring an uprising of, of anti-Jewishness or anti-Semitism to the world? Uh, absolutely, Jay and I talk about this probably implicitly or explicitly every week about every topic. I agree with you. Um, a couple of responses though, uh, real quickly, because yes, yes, 110% I agree with you. So the question is, what do we do about it? Right? That's really what you're asking, right, in a lot of ways. Of course. Uh, one, one is, is there is also a considerable counterattack on the part of those opposing anti-Semitism. So here you have the big tech companies deciding which algorithm they're going to send you to, right? But my, uh, as you know, this is an issue of uh, deep concern to me. Probably half my time on the web is spent surfing about anti-Semitism. And I get a lot of active educational and governmental groups opposing this. So one answer, of course, is the best thing about bad medicine is good medicine. And apropos of that, I think it's time the Republicans get off their tushies and uh, allow Lipstadt to be the special envoy for anti-Semitism. They bottle up Deborah Lipstadt's uh, appointment as other ones. Uh, got Biden appointed her. And this gets to your, to your point of view because she as somebody with US governmental and international authority can address this. You know, what, what should Germany do about multimedia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my, my second uh, response is apropos of your education, is that most of these, uh, the, the marginal groups are important. In other words, people who aren't necessarily inclined, but it suddenly shows up. You know, I don't really want to eat a cheeseburger, but it shows up on my site, I'm going to eat it. Uh, the hardened anti-Semites will be hardened anti-Semites, right? What we're really talking about mm -hmm. is young, young people or somewhat young people who are uh, impressionable. And that's where our education has to take a role, a formal classroom education. But more profoundly than just about the Shoah, it's teaching people critical skills, right? To know, <laughs> look, that this website is uh, created and perpetrated by people who uh, have nothing good in mind, and I'm going to be able to comprehend that. So, right, we're talking about the substance. But at a deeper level, we're talking about people's ability to be critical. And that's where we really have a problem because let, let's be honest, the web is, is just like going to a marketplace. It's really an example of consumerism. So how, how do we educate people to consume properly on the web? Okay, I, I but think the one, my, final point though, my final point to you is though, and Jay knows this, I tend to be libertarian on the free speech issue. Right. So for example, I don't agree with the German law that says Holocaust provision or denial is illegal. I think that's a slippery slope. Because <laughs> that's one of the responses, right? Just make this illegal and just censor it. But, but that, Peter, that, genocide, yeah. we need, Peter, um, just one quick question, because I know sure. we don't have a lot of time. Genocides in general, are, 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 I mean, we're talking Rwanda, we're talking China, we're talking all over the world. Right. If we lump the Holocaust into 
the genocide education experience, mm -hmm. does it help or does it hurt in making people understand what happened? Oi, oi, I'll give you a Talmudic answer. It's a Solomonic, <laughs> it's a Solomonic answer, right? It helps because apropos of what you said in particular, it allows a personal connection, right? right. A Cambodian kid can make a connection. Okay, very valuable. And I'm not saying one or the other, I'm saying we have to combine them. So we have to say, yes, I'm gonna teach the Shoah as a, one of the most extreme examples we've documented of genocide. And as Yehuda Bauer and others, you probably know there's a working group in Europe which has attempted to study and quantify all the different well, genocides we know quant of. Quantify. Let me just finish for a second. Uh, to be able to predict. So, you know, what is the economy like, the inflation rate, unemployment, et cetera. And they really have an algorithm to try to be able to predict. Okay, so if you remove the Holocaust from that, your algorithm would be incomplete. But well, I, think, said, I think what's lost on this is the magnitude. You talk about Rwanda, that was half a million people. That was terrible, terrible. It was neighbors killing neighbors. Um, and, you know, in any of these genocides you're talking about, you know, a substantial number, but none of them comes to six million. Well, focused, okay, I think we have to be careful. focused hatred and violence, six million people. And I, and I think when, you know, I think it's an important point. I'm sure you teach it, Seymour. This was really big. This was industrialized. This was a, a, it amounted to a national effort, whether everybody knew about it or not. And I but think I when we teach about what, it today, we should stress that. Okay, so Jay, I, I have to tell you, and I, and I have to tell this to Peter too. When I lecture on the Holocaust today, the, the Holocaust is a means to an end for me. It's to help young people understand how they have to change their way of thinking. I'm talking about the way they live where they, uh, where they uh, denigrate other people, the bullying that they do, how it all started, how, how, the, how the Jews were taken advantage of. Uh, uh, it's, it's important for me, not just to teach about the Holocaust and the numbers and the facts and all that. It, more important to me is to help them understand how to live their life today. If you're talking to somebody, Seymour, Say on the mainland, you know, where the same level of tolerance doesn't exist. And this person is, uh, you know, saying things like the Jews will not replace us. This person is bigoted, living in a world of bigotry, a bubble of bigotry connected with all kinds of other, you know, bigotry and hatred issues. OK, um, and it's you and this person. What do you say to get him out of that bubble or her? I don't. I don't check. There's no way that I could convince anybody who has a, a, a black and white opinion that there's gray, it's not going to work. I listen to him and I say, if that's your opinion, more power to you, that's what you think. I think you're absolutely incorrect and you have to be willing to respect my opinion. I'm respecting yours, respect mine. And of course they say, I do, I do. And they probably don't, but it doesn't matter, Jane. We're not going to turn the world over. All we're going to do is try to make the world a better place to live in. That's my job. Peter, you have lots of thoughts about this. You want to take a whack at summarizing and expressing those thoughts? I don't think I'll give my thoughts because that's going to take another week or two. So let me just thank, thank Seymour very much, as always. And let me, um, Seymour, correct, correct me, but usually at the end, we like to summarize what our guest has, has given to us. So let me just give a couple of points and then correct me. Uh, Seymour's dedication to education, uh, particularly at the pre-college level. So the way in which Holocaust and genocide education can and should be part of normal social studies courses, public and private schools. Does that make, make sense? Seymour, is that representing your yes, goal? Yes, you're 100% okay. correct. And, and secondly, and not really secondly, but A, A number one is that's connected to uh, a sense of human decency, of respect, of uh, disagreement in words, but not violence. And so the education about the Holocaust is, yes, an education about the Shoah, but to a greater degree, it's an education about humanity and the decency that uh, we really need to apply to humanity. Um, and as far as the history, Jay, I think we should come back. I'd like to invite Seymour back, uh, because in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of very important historiographical contributions to the study of the Shoah. So when you take a course at the college level on the Holocaust, it's very different than it was 10 years ago. 
not, not denial, uh, historiographical revision. In other words, yes, it happened. Uh, it happened here and there. Uh, who did it happen to, why, et cetera. And it will even expand your great fears, Jane, because among the historical contributions has been the policy of anti-Semitism outside of Europe. So the Grand Mufti in Jerusalem, uh, the Vichy in the French colonies, uh, Jews living in Indochina. So you can go to sleep even more worried, all right? Now, the answer to your question I tell my students is uh, not numbers, because really, if you want to get in the numbers game, uh, Stalin and Mao are the biggest genocidal maniacs, right? There's not even a, there's not even a debate, <laughs> okay? But one way to look at this is that if Hitler had won, every Jew everywhere would have been a victim. Uh, the consequences of the Rwandan genocide are horrendous. But Hutus and Tutsis very rarely chased and murdered each other outside of Rwanda. Uh, Stalin a little bit, Mao very little. One of, the, one of the unique aspects of this really is that potentially, potentially every Jew everywhere would be a victim. And I think that actually existentially expands on the six million. Uh, no historian agrees with six million. Right? I mean, there's, there's no way to say exactly 6 million. And there's a controversial Israeli documentary out about that now, but we don't debate that. What we're interested in those, right? Those who were able to escape, to survive, and that 6 million would have been at least doubled or trebled, right? If Hitler and his allies had won. So that's how I teach it. Not, not okay. 6 million versus 1 million, because you see what you could get into potentially and your viewers would be interested in this. Uh, is African-American slavery, because of the numbers, greater than any other or more worrisome than any other form of slavery? And that's, that's an interesting historical question, because in the numbers game, there's okay. no doubt 20 million people were upset by the transatlantic slave trade. There's no other slave trade probably in human history, which is comparable. Hey, Mark, does that, does this that is up, it's up to you. We're running out of time now, okay. as we always do on this show. Uh, so can can you uh, can you leave your words uh, that you would like people to remember about this conversation? I want people to remember that we are all ambassadors, and it's not ambassadors of the Holocaust. We are ambassadors to make the world a better place. Use the teachings and the lessons of the Holocaust to make people understand to treat each other fairly, to treat each other with respect. That's the key to what I try to do. And I really believe that I get somewhere doing that. So I hope the next time we get together, we can talk a little bit more about that because that to me is the key. I need Peter to help me understand how to teach that even better than I'm teaching it now. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Peter. Much Thank you, Seymour. Thank, Thank you, Seymour. You. Thank you, Peter. I am, on the other hand, not as liberal as either of you guys. I am <laughs> still outraged. I'm outraged with what happened, and I'm outraged with the anti-Semitism that has grown up in our world. Uh, and our engineer told me that he found a map during the show uh, showing geographically all those camps. So Eric, would you play that map now? <clears throat> there are a lot of camps. There are a lot of camps. And, and, the, people who, the people who died who were killed, they can't report to us. History is told by the survivors. And uh, if we wanted to have a really clear picture of the horror, we would have to speak to those who were killed. Thank you so much, Seymour. Thank you, Peter, remembering you Remembrance Day. Thanks for all your Thank good you. work, Seymour, to repair the world. Thank you. Aloha. Yeah. Aloha. Aloha.